In 1920, the 19th Amendment achieved ratification from the states and guaranteed the right of American women to vote in U.S. elections. The same year the Volstead Act went into effect, it banned the sale, transport, and production of alcoholic beverages. Both laws would shape American life in the decade ahead. And then there was the pandemic. What Americans called the Spanish flu had already killed about 600,000 people. Everyone knew somebody who had either died or fallen gravely ill. And it wasn't done killing just yet. During the winter of 1920, 6,000 people died from the virus in New York City alone. Some Americans must have wondered if these, these cycles of infection would continue indefinitely, except that this time it was really over, and a comparable event would not shake the Republic for another century. My name is John Bodden, and you're listening to Reforming Dixie, stories from Alabama during the 1920s. This podcast is the work of students at the University of Montevallo, a liberal arts college near Birmingham, where I work as a professor of history. I've had the fun of watching a group of students write research papers about different topics. But before we dive into uh, these stories uh, about life in Alabama, it feels appropriate to say a few things, general things, about the United States and, and, and paint the landscape of it. In many respects, it's easy for us to recognize the 1920s. People listen to radios and use cars to get around. City dwellers went to stadiums and department stores. And yet, certain aspects of life in the 1920s would strike us as strange, peculiar, or outright horrifying. In 1920, the country was still in the process of demobilizing four million soldiers after the First World War. Such dislocations, um, including wartime rationing and large-scale mobilizations, have not occurred in the United States since 1945. And, and the experience of such collective sacrifice has really faded from American memory. The idea of a happy childhood did not exist 100 years ago, and the way parents raised their children would shock many of our current sensibilities. Millions of Americans lived on farms without electricity or indoor plumbing. People lacked accurate weather forecasting, which added a whole layer of uncertainty to daily life, especially in, in the countryside. The NAACP spent the entire decade trying to obtain federal anti-lynching legislation because horrific mob violence still occurred and overwhelmingly affected black men. One student suggested a, a question for our project subtitle, did the 1920s roar in Alabama? And though Alabama suffered from widespread poverty and underdevelopment, all of the great trends sweeping the nation touched the state. The industrial city of Birmingham grew at a spectacular rate. Reformers increased the number of schools. People moved to cities and thousands of African Americans joined a region-wide migration out of the South in search of economic opportunity and relief from, from uh, racial terrorism. Well, let's spend a minute or two talking about the economy. Then, as now, the United States uh, was the world's largest economy, an industrial behemoth and great exporter of goods. Between 1922 and 1929, the U.S. economy experienced robust growth. Consumer goods became available to more people than ever, and millions of Americans purchased stock in publicly traded companies. Living standards went up, not down. At the same time, this was an era of historic income inequality. Federally mandated minimum wages did not exist, and workers had few protections. Progressives called for a ban on child labor and the right of private sector employees to unionize. It was also a time when regional disparities mattered much more than they do today. For example, workers in New York and Illinois had average incomes uh, more than double those of workers in Alabama and Mississippi in 1920. The South was poorer than the rest of the country, much poorer and less industrialized. Today that stark regional divide is, is no longer uh, true. New York has an average household income of $68,000, while in Alabama it's $50,000. So there's a difference, but it's not a yawning gap. During the 1920s, automobile manufacturing emerged as the economy's most dynamic sector, and the automobile industry centered around Detroit, Michigan, 
was where entrepreneurship thrived and great fortunes developed, much like California's Silicon Valley in our time. Thanks to Detroit's innovations, the cost of cars went down, and um, by the middle of the decade, 25% of American families owned a car. Now, I want to make the point that no country in the world had anywhere close to this kind of vehicle ownership. And so people learned to drive all at once, um, despite the lack of paved roads or traffic signals. And not surprisingly, the period was dangerous uh, for drivers. In fact, you were 20 times more likely to die in a car crash per thousand miles traveled than you are today, 20 times. And this dovetails with something else interesting. The same decade when car crashes became a major killer of Americans, the country started living much longer than before. And to put this into perspective a bit, uh, for millennia, human beings lived about 35 years on average, and about one-third of all infants uh, died before reaching their first birthday. A sad fact of life was the frequency with which parents, parents watched their children die. Well, these, these, these ancient patterns uh, started to change in the 20th century and then started to change with startling speed in the 1920s uh, in Japan and, and the Western countries. Improved hygiene and medical knowledge lowered infant mortality. Vaccines for diphtheria and tuberculosis became available. Relatively few women died in childbirth. Life expectancy shot up past 50 years on average. Well, the, the implications of this public health revolution are, are truly massive, um, and I won't say much of anything else except life expectancies were going up across the board, across different groups. Well, if automobiles revolutionized mass transit, radio and telephone transformed mass communication. Roughly 40% of American households had these new technologies by 1929, and the implications are manifold. Invisible radio waves crossed state lines and made it possible for millions of Americans to hear music, news, and live sports. Both technologies reduced the isolation of rural communities. And they raised the question of regulation. Uh, that is, what role, if any, should the federal government play in radio broadcasting? Should government limit certain kinds of speech or music uh, the radio waves transmitted? And so the questions Americans had then resemble our contemporary debate about social media and the internet, about big tech. With respect to popular culture, the 1920s was quite a time to be alive. A lot was changing and going on. It was a dynamic era. A generation of Western women called flappers demonstrated an independence unthinkable to many of their mothers and grandmothers. They cut their hair short and wore more comfortable and more revealing clothing. Flappers defied conventional expectations of womanhood. They, they smoked, drank, and danced. So gender norms were, were, were undergoing a change. Um, now one continuity with, with our time is that Americans enjoyed professional sports. Superstars like Babe Ruth uh, of the New York Yankees and Jack Dempsey, the heavyweight champion of the world, drew record-setting crowds. In 1926, the University of Alabama's football team went to the Rose Bowl. And for people in the South, and especially in Alabama, this was a very big deal. Uh, Alabama had, a, had an exciting come-from-behind victory against the University of Washington, and that game impacted national consciousness. The South, uh, as everyone knew, uh, could be very poor, but its football teams could play. In Southern California, Hollywood emerged as the dominant producer of narrative motion pictures with dramatic uh, lights, stunts, and visual effects. One could go to the theater and see hit films such as Safety Last and The General, which I should mention are in the public domain and uh, you can watch them on YouTube. And they hold up as highly entertaining to, to our eyes. Not only that, motion pictures with synchronized sound called talkies debuted in 1927. Well, speaking of sound, jazz music gained popularity and became associated with American culture. Jazz greats such as Bessie Smith, Louis Armstrong, George Gershwin, and Fats Waller made the decade home with catchy tunes. And W.C. Handy, a native of Florence, Alabama, popularized the Delta Blues. So it's, it's an exciting time for music. Uh, a lot was happening. 
And it's worth mentioning that not everyone liked jazz music. Some people thought it was too sensual or that it, it inspired immoral dancing. And racists disliked its connection to African-American culture. Well, it's striking to me how some features of American life have not changed very much in 100 years. Listening to the radio, going to the mu movies, driving a gasoline-powered car, talking about sports. And the era's culture wars uh, would feel familiar to us, too. Divisions existed over the, re the role of women in society. Some Americans supported prohibition, others openly defied the new law. Rural and urban Americans could strongly resent and dislike each other. Religious liberals clashed with fundamentalists over the issue of evolution and what science should be taught in the public schools. And the presence of large immigrant communities generated other bitter disagreements. In 1920, the, US, uh, the United States Census reported that 14% of the population was foreign-born, which is actually about the same percentage as our own time. Millions of Roman Catholic and Jewish immigrants had come to the United States from Southern and Eastern Europe in a massive migratory wave that began at the start of the 20th century. In California, Asian immigration um, had changed that state's demographics. Some Americans felt the country was changing too fast. And then you have bigots. They, they openly despised the newcomers as dangerous hordes, bringing crime and communism into a land where they could never really be true Americans. So you have nativism. Um, nativism among white Protestants fueled a membership boom in the anti-Catholic, anti-Semitic, anti-black Ku Klux Klan. The United States Congress passed legislation in 1924 that banned further immigration from Asia, limited arrivals from Southern and Eastern Europe, and created the Border Patrol. The volume of, of immigration into the United States dropped sharply and did not return to previous uh, peak levels until the 1980s. So this was a real hot button issue. And I, and I mention all of this to say that, that divisions are, are one part of American history. Divisions have always been with us. What, what ebbs and flows is really the degree of division and how the divisions get expressed in the political system. Uh, a final comment is, is the political temperature was hot in the 1920s, um, if not as angry and, and bitter as our time. Finally, I want to say a few things about the United States and the wider world. In 1920, the United States was emerging from the First World War stronger than ever. European nations owed Washington great sums of money, uh, and New York replaced London as the world's financial center. The United States was one of several imperial nations with overseas colonies. U.S. Marines occupied countries in Central America and the Caribbean during the decade. And from its bases in Hawaii and the Philippines, the United States competed with the Empire of Japan for predominance in the Pacific. Well, what's interesting to note is that while the United States Navy modernized its fleet and acquired aircraft carriers, strong currents of isolationism swept the nation. Congress refused to join the League of Nations and greatly reduced the size of the U.S. Army. Then, as now, Americans asked if it was right or advisable to intervene in the affairs of faraway nations. What was the United States' place in the world? This podcast, Reforming Dixie, explores several interrelated topics about Alabama during the 1920s, including educational reform, religious life, female activism, and convict leasing. Each story sheds light on life in Alabama 100 years ago and presents an opportunity to reflect on the past and how it connects to the present. I did not pick any of the topics, so it's been fun to see what the students have come up with. So let's begin with a chapter about Fairhope, an unusual town in Lower Alabama. Here is Katie Inabet. 